when I was 10, I came up with this idea. See, I've always been super, super into like science-y stuff, exploration space stuff. Um, people tell me I have the same sort of, uh, I, well, I used to have the same sort of attitude that Elon Musk has today. But yeah, when I was, when I was 10, I came up with this idea that, um, it started with the thought that there's probably a ton of other planets just like ours. You know, you look at the universe and you come to that conclusion, not you look at the universe, but you, you look at what, what is said about the universe. You watch all YouTube videos and, uh, you come to this, this realization that, oh, there's, there's gotta be aliens out there. You know, before there was all this real hype about it. Like, I don't know if you guys remember, this is 2010, by the way. I just want to mention this. However, however um, old I am is whatever year it is. I was born in January 2000. So if I'm 10 years old, then it's 2010, okay? I was class of 2018 and all that. So in 2010, I don't know if you guys remember this. The majority of the world did not believe in aliens. Like most people, if you ask most people, if I ask my parents, uh, my cousins, my, my brother, everyone, all my friends, and I ask them like, do you guys believe in aliens? They've been like, no way, no. Um, at least that's what I felt like it was around me. Maybe uh, in actuality it was different, but from, from my own experience, the vast majority of the world did not believe in aliens. And now it seems like it's, you're very hard pressed to find someone who doesn't believe in aliens. But it's, it's crazy remembering, remembering that time. But the, the simple, the sheer odds of life like ourselves probably forming is really high depending on how the universe is. And I had, I had this thought in my head that you, you have to sort of piece together, okay, what are the odds of, of life forming? As if that'll really help you with anything. So you start to logic your way around it. And I'm, I'm really just trying to understand. I'm trying to fully wrap my head around the concept. And my thought process was like, it's not really that we're here um, and life forming is unique or unlikely, but rather it was certain. And it, it would be weird if we didn't exist. It's like, it's like saying, it's like saying winning the lottery is unlikely, right? So if it's unlikely, it might as well not happen, like at all. Well, no, someone is going to win the lottery. Like someone will win, for sure. And it's kind of an odd thing because for a person to win the lottery is unlikely. Like for someone to win, it's rare, right? But there will 100% be a winner. There will certainly be a winner. So in a way, you can say winning the lottery is so unlikely, and you can also say winning the lottery is certain. And both statements would be right. And in this, in this analogy of like lottery to life, everyone who didn't win the lottery is planets with no life. So the winners, the winner of the lottery can't say well, it was so unlikely to happen. No, it was certain to happen. The only people that could say that are the winners. It happened to you. It, it did. So there's no unlikely or likely about it. And when people think about how unlikely it is that we exist, I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Because if the lottery winner exists, then the only possibility of being able to perceive the world's existence would be through the lens of the lottery winners. So we're able to perceive this because we're in that set of lottery winners. It's not like the other species that never got to exist can perceive the unlikelihood of existence um, simply by wondering how unlikely it is. They can't exist in the first place to wonder that. And it's like these two these two sentences clashing together where existence is unlikely but existence is also a certainty and it's less of a it's more of a linguistic fermi paradox 
Um, but it was just my way of coming to the conclusion of like, I think therefore I am. And not in like a, a universal perspective, but on a very shallow, well, shallow quote unquote, relative to like the philosophy of like um, uh, an axiomatic um, understanding of like, is how can we exist? You know, how can the universe exist? Compared to that, it's a very shallow way of thinking of, of imagining ourselves as just another species and aliens could be just like us. That's a very shallow um, thing to to think about compared to that. But it was just, it's a different kind of, I think, therefore I am. In a way, it's kind of like an anti-Fermi paradox. Or rather, it's somewhat of a dismissal of the idea of life being unlikely to form. Or even likely to form. Like, it isn't that it's unlikely or likely. It happened. There is... There is a species that is the only definitive statement we can make about it. As far as we know, the evidence shows no other life existing anywhere else in the universe. Tabby star? Okay, that's something we gotta look into. But extraordinary, cl extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Occam's razor, bro. If, if there is a simpler answer, that's probably right. But we have no actual solid evidence that we're not alone in the, in the universe. Now, when people like to look at the Fermi paradox at, the, at this, as this like mathematical thing, I don't really see it that way. I see it... I don't even see it as a paradox, actually. Like, my view, um, at least when I was 10, not, not so much right now, but when I was 10, it was more of a philosophical take on the ideas of the Fermi Paradox. Not necessarily, like, a scientific one, but, like, okay, the, from a scientific perspective, the Fermi Paradox raises entirely different questions. Like, what's stopping other life from forming that, you know, eats tin and breeds arsenic like there's really no end there's no um no uh bounds that we can really put on on life to establish a likelihood of it forming uh, through nature you know like if you look at it what people talk about it online it doesn't really make sense why life is so sparse, intuitively at least. But that's because we have a sample size of one. We don't even know the most important information about that sample either. Like, we don't even have a single control group. You can say, okay, Mars, that's our control group, right? Life hasn't formed there. But, mm, I don't know. I wouldn't, um... I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't go there. That seems unrelated. Because, hmm, I don't know how to explain it. Everything else that is not life is not life. So it's not like you have two things in a test tube and you're using one as a control and one as your experiment. It's like everything else, including the test tube and the room that you're in and the oxygen you're breathing, that is all your control. And the only thing, the only... Um, sample size is the thing in the test tube that you're testing. So it's it's difficult to even have a, a control group. It's difficult. There's no other examples of, of life existing in the universe, any, on, any extraterrestrial life. So there's no way for us to really make any definitive conclusions about it, other than like, we're here, you know? So my idea is not like an original idea. Um, but that's only because somebody else thought of it before me. But I think this train of thought can lead you into some really cool, like, not even just the I think therefore I am. I think it doesn't just have implications on like existence and like the nature of truth and what we consider to be um, truths in the world and, like, infallible logic. But I think it also has implications about, like, the universe and extraterrestrial life, in a, in a philosophical way, uh, kind of. 
But basically, if you were to say, wow, it's so unlikely that life formed like this and here we are, like that's the paradox. That sentence itself makes no sense. It's an oxymoron. Like you can't, the winner of the lottery has no business saying, wow, it was so, it's so unlikely for you to win the lottery. You know, you won. And, and that was my contribution. It wasn't necessarily a paradox or anything. It was just pointing out this, this absurd way of, um, this absurd thought process that people have on the surface when um, a conversation arises. And, you know, in the first five minutes of the conversation about aliens, they always say somebody in the, somebody in the group, you know, at the bar or whatever is going to go like, yeah, but, you know, life is so unlikely to form like this, you know? Somebody's always going to say that. They always do. And this is when I was 10 years old, this was just my counter to that, to my understanding of like, all right, enough of repeating yourselves, NPCs. That's a stupid thing to say. But, I mean, it's whatever. I'm not so um, picky about what people say anymore. Not as much, but, yeah, just not as much. When people talk about, like, the odds of life emerging from carbon or, or silicon-based chemistry, for that matter. Nobody knows the odds of for life forming in general. For all we know, life could have actually formed multiple times here on Earth alone. And there is a, a hint of evidence to suggest that it did. Um, I, I know some people think that mycelium could have spawned uh, from an entirely different chemical process than the first archaea did. I don't believe that to be true. Um, from, from what I can tell, the people who actually believe it are not uh, scientist scientists. They're more um, like people who have ingested mycelium. So, I mean, there's definitely something to consider there. But I, I don't think they form separately from the very first microorganisms. I think... Every mycelium alive today has a common ancestor with every single bacteria today. And then protist and all that stuff. And and us as well. I think we all, every organism that you can look at and call it an organism, a living organism, all have a common ancestor. Or maybe like a a, a sea of, of common ancestors in the very early ocean of, of primordial soup. But yeah, um, I mean, I can't say that the idea is wrong. It's a very intriguing idea when you think about it, because they're so, so different. Mycelium and bacteria, or um, fungi and bacteria, I should call it fungi instead. But now that I think about it, the, the geothermal energy causing all these chemical reactions and volcanoes and all of these, um, you know, meteorites, that landed in the oceans, um, creating geysers of, of chemical rich uh, chemicals. Yeah, that that totally could have created an entirely separate set of microorganisms um, that self-replicate. And self-replicating doesn't even necessarily seem to be all that uh, all that exclusive of a skill that life has, you know. I mean, stars exist. Stars self-replicate. And, and given enough time, the energy in the system, the entire, all the stellar nursery left over will, will run out. But the same is true for life. So that is an interesting thing to think about now that I... Now that I, I wasn't thinking about this way back then. I'm thinking about it now. Like, okay, mitochondria is generally agreed to be, you know, a single-celled living organism that was eaten by a larger one. And I don't think anyone would say that your mitochondria is alive today in all your cells. Like they would consider those what we have today, living organisms. But back then, yeah, it was definitely a living organism. Or, you know, thinking about the fact that not all life that is alive today is photosynthetic, because that's such a huge evolutionary advantage. You would think that all other life would just have gone extinct by now everything would be solar powered. I mean, there actually is some credibility to this because to be completely honest with you guys, 
virology is even more of an enigma than cellular biology. Like even with all of our new shit, it's it's possible. I actually I'd go as far as to say I'm no scientist, but I'd go as far as to say it's very, very likely, almost certain, that viruses formed completely separately. Well, separately in in the way that um they're separate kinds of life forms, but maybe they formed uh through the same processes and at the same time uh, alongside each other, but they formed as separate cellular life forms. Um, I mean, after all, there is believed to be at least one virus that corresponds to every single living organism on the planet, or at least every organism that we call a living organism. But if you think about it, viruses are just a different kind of life form that don't follow the conventional rules of what we consider uh, of organisms to be alive. Actually, they can... They can't really be called life forms all that much because they're more of an amalgamation of chemistry when you really look at them um, through a microscope. Enough that it's that it's actually easy for kids to understand that uh, why we don't consider them alive if you show them uh, microscopic videos. Like when you look at the relationship between viruses and bacteria under a microscope, like you look at the battles that they have, you realize that on that scale, like, this is all business. It's all for the sake of entropy. And all of these so-called wars that go on in evolution, uh, from that scale to up to the scale that we're at right now, all of this conflict, um, species going extinct and whatnot, that really is just a giant set of chemical reactions trying to prove to another set of chemical reactions that they are indeed the most efficient and optimal way for the universe to reach entropy. Like, that's really all evolution, you know, all uh, reproduction and survival. That's really all it is. And now we've reached us, you know, the, the peak, where now we're not only uh, m extracting energy and making um, areas of the universe reach ground state, that we never intended to in nature, that we were never a part of. Now we're trying to harness energy from Dyson spheres and we have plans to, not we're not doing it, but we have plans to, uh, you know, become a type one, type two, type three civilization. People are theorizing about how we can get a lot of energy from black holes and uh, nuclear fusion and things like that, you know, from black hole, like black hole accretion disks or whatever, not not necessarily accretion disk, but the forces, the um, tidal forces or gravitational forces, taking advantage of that gravitational potential energy to get actual energy energy out of it. Yeah, we are definitely playing a part in pushing the universe to reach entropy faster. And um, that's why we're able to do things like make vaccines to viruses, because we're like, hey, y'all can't kill us we're the we're the ones that um that the universe we're the ones fulfilling the ultimate will and desire of the universe as best as it wants it you guys are not as efficient as us so yeah if anything when you look at it at that cruel and cold level it, we really do have somewhat of a justification for killing all these viruses getting vaccinated and whatnot. If you really look at the universe at that scale, there, there is nothing harmonious or beautiful about it. Like if you look at, a, at viruses closely enough, the whole idea of a, a universe being all harmonious and like all like God of Spinoza, like Einstein said, like that's all bullshit. I always hear people go like, oh, if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, we would burn up. And if we were just a little bit further, we would all freeze to death. Look at how the universe is so perfectly catered to keep us alive. Like, this one is obviously stupid, but to kids it makes sense. And to some adults, <laughs> they even say stuff like this. It isn't, just to clarify, it isn't the universe that's catered its properties to fit the needs of humans. It's humans that shaped our needs to fit the properties of the universe. It's called billions of years of evolution. 
if we were closer to the sun and life somehow still formed, after all those years, we'd reach a point where we would have evolved to survive in that climate. And we'd be saying the same thing. We'd be like, wow, if we were any further away from the sun, you know, that would be, oh my God, if the temperature was 72 degrees Fahrenheit on earth on a daily basis, imagine how catastrophic it would be. Like, that's what people would say. It's it's a stupid, like, um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll go that far. It is stupid. Even though I've heard a lot of adults, like family members, say that sort of thing. But it's stupid. I'm not saying they're stupid, but the thought is. And also, the universe is fairly forgiving. Like, we can deviate quite heavily from nature and still survive. We have been doing that. We can actually um, be quite a bit closer or further away from the sun, and we'd still be fine. The habitable zone is not a thin line. Um, it's, it's a spectrum, and it's a, it's a pretty large pretty large spectrum at that. Like, Proxima Centauri B's planets, or Proxima Centauri B, which is the planet of Proxima Centauri, is also within the habitable zone. And people are probably going to end up living on Mars, which, with... A uh, heavy, heavy accommodation is survivable. I mean, living on the moon is survivable too, so. Yeah. What was I saying? Damn, I forgot. I really forgot. I guess I'll just continue on this train of thought then. I forgot what I was saying too in this train of thought. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, if we needed, like, these absolute perfect, like, God-given conditions that we have now to survive, nobody would ever consider going to Mars a possibility to begin with. Like, nature is quite forgiving. Days can be, you know, quite a bit longer or shorter and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It would screw up your circadian rhythm. You'd have some health problems, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. We'd still have a much greater life expectancy and quality of life than people did, you know, 200 years ago with a flawless circadian rhythm. But yeah, all of these, um, all of these, like, Spinoza and nature-type gods, all kinds of gods, archetypal, story-type gods, religious supernatural type gods, uh, excuses to act in a certain way type of gods, or to justify your actions type of gods, and even like just gaps in scientific understanding type of gods. All of it, I had had enough by the time I was 10. I was sick of it. I was fed up with it. 